Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Recluse, for this presentation of the book, who covers the the uh, the different sections that try to address this. Let's say the the state of the disciplines we are plunged in today. Today, in my presentation of the book, I will, at the same time, thank add something to the to what was the the object uh, of the book of the period of time in which the, the book addresses <coughs> cognitivism. Because the, um, the term paradigm I chose for the title of this lecture or this presentation um, uh, allows us to include, as in the recent histories of uh, cognitive science, who include inside the developments of cognitive science the moments of uh, cybernetics. And um, the, in that sense, paradigm, who was introduced in, the, in epistemology by Thomas Kuhn, uh, was a tentative to introduce uh, into American epistemology, the French uh, tradition, starting off from Bachelard and later Foucault, uh, the characteristic feature of it being the um, singling out of major points of discontinuity in the sciences. This is far removed from the Anglo-American epistemological tradition which tends to favor accumulative models. Moreover, uh, Kuhn's attempt ended in failure. Contemporary American epistemology cares little for paradigmas, except perhaps of the world. Uh, if you read Stephen Chapin on the history of modern science, uh, it's rather uh, different discourse. The idea of paradigma remained a reference among sociologists. For instance, the term cybernetic paradigma has, for example, been taken up by the Canadian sociologist Céline Lafontaine in her approach to the historical antecedents of cognitivism. One of my trainees recently uh, defended his PhD thesis in which he precisely stresses the pros and cons of using this extension uh, notion of paradigma. Because probably cybernetics seems to be, on the one hand, an antecedent of the cognitive science, but it's profoundly <coughs> different. Cybernetics is far more of a multidisciplinary conversation held together not so much by strongly determined parameters as by the outstanding personalities of those who initiated this conversation. That is to say, Norbert Wiener and John von Neumann, both exceptional characters who introduced major breaks in epistemology were the founders of the discourse. But there was, never was an academic discipline called cybernetics. Wiener invented the word in 47, uh, pulling together various things he had written over the previous 10 years. He was himself a provocateur with a taste for rallying people. He co-organized the Macy conferences, who were the, uh, the, the starting point from the cybernetic movement. He soon met von Neumann, who was then in the process of building his machines, the computers that were to give rise to this paradigm. 
making way for the dream of a computational mind. The cybernetic period lasted until Wiener moved away from the neurologist Maculock in 53, being horrified at the prospect set out by the new uses of sciences for social reformatting in keeping up with the desire of certain researchers. The attraction of cybernetics was that time on the wane and it fell to artificial intelligence to gather together the various different contributions. Wiener, during the Cold War, was haunted by the threat of nuclear warfare and its prospect of Holocaust. He assigned to science a contrary direction, that of introducing order in a world that would necessarily end in entropy, as a theory stated it. I quote him, the declaration of our own nature and the attempt to build an enclave organ of organization in the face of nature's overwhelming tendency to disorder is an insolence against the gods and the iron necessity that they impose. Here lies tragedy, where here lies glory too. He sought to distance himself from the science of his time with what's becoming a vast anonymous bureaucracy, a big science. He says, in which each member travels a pre-assigned path and in which the sentinels of science, when they come to the ends of the beat, present arms, do an about face, and march back in the direction from which they have come. Graphic. The cybernetic conversation introduced by Wiener and von Neumann highlights beyond the paradigm the role in the history of sciences of the what Lacan called the scientist desire, which turns into drama in times of crisis over the foundations of the discipline. It seems to me that the subjective crisis that Wiener went through, which led him to put a stop to the cybernetic conversation, concerns a crisis of anxiety that was experienced by one of these great scholars and that has a structural value. I quote Wiener, we have contributed to the initiation of a new science which embraces technical developments with great possibilities for good and for evil. We can only hand it over to the world that exists about us. And this is the world of Bergen-Belsen and Hiroshima. We do not have even have the choice of suppressing these new technical developments. So, he wanted to limit these scientists, to keep them away from the development of weapons by confining his own personal efforts to those fields, such as physiology and psychology, most remote from war and exploitation. He was also to issue a dire warning about the new generation of self-regulating machine which would take control of society in the hands of political leaders who attempt to, I quote him, control their populations by means not of machine themselves, but through political technique as narrow and indifferent to human possibility as if they had, in fact, been conceived mechanically. It so happened that the second conversation within the history of cognitive science, the one who initiate with artificial intelligence in the MIT, was interrupted between uh, these two moments cybernetics, artificial intelligence, was interrupted by the Chomsky parenthesis. Chomsky places himself neither in one camp or another. He clearly states that he considers that all the artificial intelligence developments 
don't interest in him because they are founded of, on uh, Markov algorithms. Chomsky considers, considered at that time, that rules of linguistics should, on the contrary, be freed from the rules proposed by Markov, that is to say, from rules in which hierarchies of algorithms depend on a previous state of development. Chomsky thought out in a strict hierarchical chain. Chomsky thought out a type of rule that had nothing to do with either cybernetic teleology and regulation or the operation of computerization. This meant that the second conversation which emerged around the neo-behaviorists who were recycled at the MIT had little to do either with cybernetics and with Chomsky. As I see it, the cognitive paradigm is a kind of discourse set out in motion by the Wiener von Neumann MacPillock exchanges, which then underwent a rupture before the emergence of further items in concert with the computational model. What is striking in the cognitive conversation that followed, and which to this day has been animating the neuro movement as described by Nicholas Rose in his various books, especially in the last one we call the neuro, the new brain sciences and the management of the mind, which was published in Princeton University Press, uh, is that extraordinary heterogeneous things have been lumped together <coughs> by a sort of unifying glue something like a large vague idea. All it has, all it takes to, to be included in it is the vague whiff of the ideology of evaluation and measurement to be included in. There is also a crucial break between the two periods of the paradigm and the one in which uh, some of the consequences I uh, considered in the book, but I am trying to follow on on the exploration of this. Because in the first paradigm, the first movement, cybernetics, there was a great eagerness, notably on the part of McCulloch, to define a psychopathology and to map out its causes. Since the mind was conceived on the model of the ideal neuron, that is a biological model that was apt to generate thought, reduced to the logic of propositions in its normal functioning. Abnormal functioning was understood to arise when there is a dysfunction. So Maculloch put forward different models for the formulation of psychology, psychopathology in general. For instance, he proposed an astonishing mathematical theory of the affective psychosis in which, along with Pitts and Edwin, he presupposed two quantities, phi and phi and psi, uh, where if one of them rises, then the organism passes from the normal level of feeling to the extremes of circular depression or catatonic exaltation, which is a model of the manic depressive type. Meanwhile, an increase in the other value would result in a switch from stupor to manic excitation. These are built on the model of an oscillating variation of a cybernetic machine gone mad. So he proposed to reorganize, reorganize psychopathology as a whole around his theory and to establish the widest possible statistical correlation in order to build a kind of classification of the brain's paralogism. There was a strict correlation then between the effect and the cause. Wiener and von Neumann similarly considered an homology between persistent ideas and circular neurological processes, which they together qualified as feedback loops. They tried to reconfigure psychology, psychopathology as a whole on the basis of this feedback process. 
an excess of negative feedback crushes all action, given right to neurosis. On the other hand, there may instead be a lack of feedback, and then one is faced with the excesses of psychosis and its major outbursts, which will ostensibly vouch for the fact that there is no longer any servo mechanism controller You see then the, the translation into a cybernetic machine of the uh, mechanical model uh, more or less established by the uh, ego psychology gang uh, around the superego, ego as a control, etc. All this translated as the uh, simple functioning machine. The models do differ between McCulloch and Wiener Neumann differ a great deal, in particular when it comes to taking into account brain plasticity and traces of neural stimulation. McCulloch held that since it's impossible to establish any strict causality between experience and its trace due to the fact that the, there is constant reorganization of the inscriptions of mnemonic traces in the brain one is not able to reconstruct the state of the brain in the past. Therefore, in his view, the past has nothing to do with the constitution of a true psychopathology. Wiener and von Neumann took a contrary path and offered a fresh transcription of certain aspects of psychoanalysis, and in particular, they rescued the unconscious as memory traits, forming a series of, of hypotheses as to its functioning over time. It's interesting to know that it was prior to the establishment of the system and foundation of long and short-term memories and the Eric Kendall model, who made compatible the intelligence, the artificial intelligence model with the learning theory, including neural traces. What's striking with the new variety of cognitism we have, if there is in the, our present state, there is a deep hiatus between the variety of descriptions of cognitive processes and the monotony of behavioral therapeutic re-education. The cognitive paradigm can display great variations ranging nowadays from the computational to connectionism. And now that we are being promised the quantum computer in which we shall have not only the binary zero and one to describe the state of the machine, but also superpositions of zero and one, we are going to see models of thought that will be even more complicated. Regardless of the declaration from those who assert that that practice draws its inspiration from connexionism or quantum mechanics or a computational plane thing, at the factual level, there is a very large autonomy between cause and treatment. For instance, from the standpoint of strict behaviorism, when Lovas, the founder of uh, the ABBA, thing, established his system, he was careful to add that he had no hypothesis at all about the causes of the trouble he was dealing with. This is what allowed him to treat autism in the same way that he treated transsexualism or homosexuality, by aiming at nothing more than behavioral modification. We could uh, linger a little more on the uh, first moment, on this cybernetic moment, because there is a strange correlation between psychoanalysis and the cybernetic period. And we could take a look at, more at that moment in the articulation of the uh, uh, cybernetics with the history of psychoanalysis. In the history of psychoanalysis, there was 
the word that cut. When, in 1951, a manuscript was found previously, previously thought lost uh, in Freud's own hand, the hand of the Freud, the neurologist, it was sent to his friend Fleece, then thought lost, and then brought up by Barry Bonaparte, who had, so who purchased it from his family. It was uh, edited by the Ego Psychology Group, and in particular Ernst Chris, who then published it. Their interpretation of the, the passage who was found there of Freud before psychoanalysis, or Freud at the moment on the verge of, invented, of inventing psychoanalysis, Freud the neurologist. So they said that he, Freud had gone clearly from a mechanical neurological model to a psychological model. That was the interpretation that was said to dominate until two men took issue with it in France Lacan, and uh, David Rappaport in the United States, uh, who worked in the uh, manager clinic, but was a member of the Columbia before. He was an eminent member of New York's uh, Jewish intelligentsia, and he gathered together a group of brilliant students to study precisely these new neurological model that was uh, uh, arriving there. One of them was Daniel Kahneman, who went to win the uh, Nobel Prize in 2002 in economics, behavioral economics. He has said that uh, they studied it, like he said, like the Talmud. Indeed, there was a concerted effort to step outside the framework of the psychoanalysis of ego psychology by taking into consideration a reading of the systems for a neurological inscription. There was another one also who was a member of that group, Eric Kendall, who went to win the Nobel Prize himself in medicine in 2000. And each have their own way to telling their story. Kahneman tries to resolve the tension between, on the one hand, everything that is for cognition, pattern recognition, instantaneity, and on the other, the long-term processes. He said the state there are two types of process. One, everything that happens in a blink, as Malcolm Gadwell, popular science book, has it, including love at first sight, thin slices, spontaneous pattern recognition, rapid recognition processes, and then on the contrary, the slow rational processes. But these slow rational processes is not the, only the embedment of reason. It's rather the embedment of error. We have fundamentally biased mechanism of cognition, of reason. We are not really acquainted with the world. We are constantly mistaken. That's what he kept from his Freudian readings. Kendall, meanwhile, tried to resolve the problem of memory by complicating the problem the, of the Heb synapse, synapse put forward in 49 to account for the trace left by stimulation of the nervous system. And so he came up with a more complicated and sophisticated model. Lacan, meanwhile, was the one in France who at the same time, more or less, it was in his seminar in, the, uh, in 64, 50, let's say 54, 55, in which he um, broke away from neurological inscription. Where Freud speak of traces, Lacan proposes a new topology, a space that is different from the biological body in which to register the traces of jouissance. These traces are not inscribed into the body or into the nervous system because they are impossible to inscribe like a singled out a recluse in this presentation. It's precisely the fact that they are impossible to inscribe, that the subject gets lost in his experience, that he gets hold to something that is not 
a neurological trace, but a signifier that inscribes itself not on the body in which it's impossible to inscribe, but rather on another kind of surface. Lacan called it this place, the other, the locus of the other. In that sense, cybernetics was useful for Lacan to, uh, let's say, to um, uh, waken up the psychoanalysts of this time, of his time, of the atmosphere they were breathing in. Sartreism, phenomenology, humanism, empathy. So to have an air of the importance of formal logic that has its importance on that locus of the other. Lacan was much closer to Wiener than to McCulloch in his use of uh, cybernetics. When at the end of his life, Wiener took fright at the prevailing eagerness to scale down to contingency in happenstance under the influence of strict processes, Lacan naturally shared his point of view. The locus of the other was constructed with the immediate addition of a bar on the capital A of the other. That is to say, it was put together with a fundamental hole in this locus. Lacan never shared the Lévi-Strauss enthusiasm for complete structures. Having, been, having said in the 60s, or having added to the relations between science and psychology, the question as to what kind of sciences it would be that would include psychoanalysis, he concluded in 73, that psychoanalysis is not a science. It is what allows a subject traumatized by science to breathe a little easier. The cognitive paradigm sent us to the founding moment of a great utopia, the utopia of building machines and robots that can account without any rest from the, or oh, without anything left over for the uh, human behavior. Engineers at MIT have just published a book on what they call the second machine age in which they explain that we shall soon be producing machines that are far more sophisticated than human intelligence and draw up a list of all the professions that are so set to vanish. For instance, like they said, 75% um, of doctors are likely to disappear, replaced by software programs that will perform diagnosis. Or let's say in the same kind of utopia, you have the West Coast with Google and Larry Page who have found a singularity university whose director holds forth in rather undemonstrative fashion on how, on how we should have perfectly singular machines that will think better than we do, uh, and so forth. In an interview back in early July this year, Sergey Brin, the other founder of Google, said that we should presume that someday we will be able to make machines that can rhythm think and do things better than we can. And of course, we'll see Google do it. For the moment, Google offers us only a driverless car that drives better than any human can. But that's probably would be the uh, more useful thing of this great utopia. Jason Lanier, who has written a book called Who Wants the Future, called this ideology into question, arguing, we are still pretending that we're inventing a brain when all we've come up to is a giant mashup of real brains. We don't yet understand how brain works, so we can't build one. The stakes are high. 
sky high. Obama Brains Initiative has dished out considerable sums of money in an attempt to achieve a modeling of a brain. Lanier, uh, is very reserved in relation to this excessive optimism, noting that all this dates from the mid 20th century, that is the cybernetic movement, this utopia. The real thing is that we have far more modest projects, which Benedict Carey, the New York Times medical reporter, has given us some inkling of, revealing of the, how they have been trying to stimulate neuronal circuits using electronic devices in order to, e to efface or activate cortical zone affected by problems related to PTSD. In the US, given the after effects of the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, or the damage of the new war going on, this potentially applies to tens of thousands of soldiers. One can also see how this more modest cybernetic dream is coming together not with large robots, with the possibility of man speaking to a machine, sp machine speaking to a man. Thanks to this, it will be possible perhaps to obtain a certain number of prostheses that will aid those who are suffering and in need. But we have some way to go. When you see at the opening ceremony of the FIFA World Cup this summer, the enormous carapace that was the exoskeleton announced to kick the first ball, and the enormous labor that it took for the man to learn to speak to the machine, uh, bad metaphor, and to learn to amplify the electrical signals from cortex and for the machine to read the signals and not as noise, all of which amount to a vast effort for a small beginning. Far from great utopian breakthrough, we are at the moment in which we are able to create some of the processes that Vina dreamed of, rather than obtain the scientific foundation of the processes of psychopathology that the National Institute of Mental Health in the US has got into its head to uncover following its break from the DSM system. Uh, yes, I, I, I had the possibility to include some of the development in the uh, English version of the book that came out. Uh, after May, leaving time to add something. But probably there are also a lot of things to follow on uh, on this line. Because the DSM project harbored the vast ambition of producing a clinic of logical positivist inspiration, a clinic that set its sights on an artificial language to be imposed on the clinician with an eye on eliminating any imprecision, meaning shifts, or misunderstandings. This classification aimed above all to rectify the imprecision of the babel of clinical traditions in favor of a language that would afford rigid designation of clinical categories that were imagined to be perfectly distinct, regardless of the irreductible comorbidity at the factual level. This will to university in clinical language was to be carried through by a clinical definition that were to say it operational. The logical form chosen by the DSM is that of a formal tree that classifies mental illnesses in keeping with the botanical model of genera, species, subspecies, that was first presented by Linnaeus in his Systema Naturae, later adopted by Darwin. The epistemologist Jan Hacking considered that the fatal flaw in the DSM project stems from this point of departure which has never been put in question and which remain an examine with his system. There is no more reason for mental illnesses to fall within a botanical classification than there would be for the chemical elements which arise from a periodic table. 
which is an absolutely different model. The periodic table has nothing volcanical about it whatsoever. Hacking offers a deep-reaching critique, and he says, perhaps in the end the DSM will be regarded as the reductio ad absurdum on the botanical project in the field of insanity. The elements that were supposed to find an inscription within the classificatory tree needed to be the most unequivocal and straightforward possible so as to respond to the ambitions of the project. That was the aim that set the stage for the encounter between the DSM project and the cognitive behavioral project. Directly observable, elementary clinical items that had been reduced to symptoms that lay outside any broader clinical identity or seemingly senseless patterns of behavior fit perfectly with this positivist and botanical project of classification. In this respect, even though the DSM project cannot be reduced to its cognitive behavioral di dimension, it cannot be separated from it either. This point of departure was never to be examined again. Spitzer DSM-3 project in the 1970s drew its inspiration from psychologists' refinements in statistics so as to pitch the psychiatric clinic at the level of the most recent statistical requirements. Stress was put on techniques that would allow for solid inter-rater reliability. That is to say the fact of zero possible variation across the description of the observed phenomena. The DSM supposed a theoretical classification was to prove to be increasingly based on the theory, but the theory of statistics. Clinical question per se were soon to be drawn out by question of statistical technique. As uh, this point was uh, noted in 92 by a uh, famous book by Kirk and uh, Kutchin in the, uh, the book named The Selling of the DSM, the Rhetoric of Science in Psychiatry. But the critique that accumulated themselves on the project uh, led Thomas Insel, director of the National Institute of Mental Health, in a momentous announcement on 29th of April uh, last year, a fortnight prior to the release of the DSM, in which he ascertains few variations between the DSM-4 and version 5. He said the latest version of the dictionaries that had been organizing the field of psychology conserved both its strength and its weakness. Its strength, he said, is its inter-rater reliability. Its weakness, and that the uh, main chart, uh, relax, uh, remained its lack of scientific validity. In other words, the language is perfect, but it means nothing. <laughs> to the extent that it declare, its declared purpose is to measure something other than itself. Incel notes that the DSM is based on a consensus of what clusters symptoms that can be easily spotted and not on the objective measure of anything whatsoever. This is why over the two last year, he, he has said, the NIMH has been launching a project that is very different from the DSM-5. They have been pulling together research domain criteria that include all the elements that have been isolated by research into objective science in the field of psychology, neuroimagery, likely biomarkers, alterations in cognitive function, <coughs> objectifiable neurological circuits among the three registers of cognition, emotion, behavior. The collecting and assembling of these elements is performed without any regard for commonly accepted clinical categories which they think of as mere surface effects. 
And in so concluded, this is why the NIMH will be reorienting its research away from the SM categories. Going forward, we will be supporting research projects that look across current categories. And those who follow the blog of INCEL on the NIMH uh, site, you can see that all along the year uh, 2000, uh, uh, last year and this year, he proposed, he didn't cease, he's a real revolutionary. He wants really to obtain, let's say, a naturalistic, pure naturalistic description of psychology with an energy that's impressive, even if I don't agree exactly with his objective, but at least this guy uh, is working. But the NIMH now wants to attach its project to the Obama administration brain initiative research. This brain modeling is still, however, in its infancy. And John Horgan, uh, who has a blog on the Scientific American, sums up the, uh, the lie of the land by saying that we are in a situation that resembles genetics before the discovery of the double helix. The field lacks any organizing principle, and so we are a long way from being able to tie up the various biological clues to the different clinical levels open to observation. Three decades of the DSM project have failed to introduce any meaningful discovery. But the research domain criteria scientific project which is supposed to be kitting up the baton, remains up in the air. Condemning the DSM project lack of scientific pertinence does not change the fact that there is nothing to replace it. The break that has thereby, thereby been brought about between research and clinic lets, uh, lets the clinic uh, loose. They remain on their own without any support from the grounds of science. Whilst the DSM instrument has not given rise to any discovery, it has proven itself a mighty instrument for population management, assigning subject to tick boxes that can be processed ever more efficiently by administrative language. Then, widening the administrative use of this category be beyond the healthcare field to include the spheres of insurance, social rights, law. This extension, which was first seen in the US, has not gone global. As an instrument of management, it meets its limitation, even its failure, in the creation of inflationary bubble category into subject as slaughtered, or even seek to be slaughtered. The assigning of subject to different categories can be computed by healthcare bureaucracy, but the uses and wishes of those who find themselves assigned to them are unpredictable. There, thus, there are constant shifts that in turn give rise to a particular kind of slippery soap effect. Next, when managers seek to reduce statistically observable epidemics by modifying their defining criteria, they come up against the wishes of the subjects themselves who might want, for example, to be considered hyperactive between 33 and 45 years of age as to be prescribed amphetamines, or who won't want to be considered bipolar because this label is less stigmatizing than others, who, who might even want to be considered Asperger, so have to have access to special education programs or the attention of publishers. This kind of disoriented classificatory reshaping produces contradictory effects. Dropping pathological classification, for instance, for most of the behaviors that were considered sexually deviant at the start of the last century goes hand in hand with the pathologization of manifold aspects of everyday life, right down to the most commonplace emotion of grief and sorrow. The constant and ongoing extension of the domain of depression is one of the most striking examples, but limits between normal and pathological are collapsing across the board. 
the overly descriptive characters of the clinical category. Uh, how long do I have? Yeah, uh, okay. Um, yes, that have uh, from the clinic of the gaze, which have been invalidated by science, are being referred to a continuum with those organic processes that are expected to be objectifiable at some future date in keeping in, in, with the model of the dementia processes that evolve for upwards of 15 years before finding an observable clinical translation. <coughs> Instead of categories that can not lead to belief in false distinctions, the researchers now prefer a model that privileges continuity. So the flip side of the medicalization of everyday life process is the recognition that psychiatric patients are merely people who are a little less, little less normal than the rest. In its difficulty to fix down the limits between normal and pathological. The DSM-5, it's confirming in its own way that Lacan said, everybody is mad. That is to say, everyone is delusional. But within a clinic that forecloses the subject with no possibility of return. What lies before us is going to break entirely from any clinic of the subject and any clinic that include a sociological dimension, which the DSM still had. Hypotheses of strict biological determination are heavy with potential social stigma. How they are handled in the clinical field will necessarily imply the involvement of affected population. Associating legal rights with the irreversible label that follows from each diagnosis presupposes considerable financing and a recasting of the healthcare system, as we are seeing, for instance, for autism. The many bodies of administrative supervision that distribute healthcare in the US, the private insurance firm, and the complex Obamacare plan are going to have to look long and hard if they are to appreciate fully the consequence of this in between period. In the UK, academics have not been gagged as they have been on the continent. The dissident voices of German Berrios in Cambridge, David Healy at Cardiff University have been heard. The British Psychological Association has long sided against the biological and statistical orientation of the DSM and played a part in the campaign to boycott the manual who, with an open letter that drew wide support. And also on the eve of the release of the DSM-5, the uh, uh, Division of Clinical Psychology of the British uh, Psychological Association declared that it would be calling for a paradigm shift in mental health issue at the opposite from what INSEL called, but rather to drop off any biological dimension, or to put it in just place. So, what, uh, um, I will uh, go through, okay. The end of an era we are witnessing always brings with it its peculiar jolts and jerks. We are emerging from a period in which a predominant paradigm was established that only allowed for opposition on the fringes. Now, the entire field is shot through with fresh contradictions between scientific hardliners, public and private healthcare bureaucracies, hub holders of various clinical tradition, and those appealing for a clinic of the subject. The clinic of the subject, uh, the ambiguity of what we call subject is, of course, at stake. Because now, uh, when, when I say that the, uh, the bureaucracies are looking for models 
in which they can reduce any individual to large patterns of behavior in large statistical series, like in the evidence-based model, is now put in competition with a model so-called of personal medicine, in which, which is a model, of course, uh, more in favor with the private firms like Google, who wants to build a whole system of accumulation of all personal data, biological or in all and styles of life, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, then can be also reduced to a computing uh, model. And so the so-called personal medicine enters in front line competition with the evidence-based, who only uh, has its uh, epistemological logical foundation on large series. But these two models don't take into account the subject as we, in the psychoanalytic tradition, see it. The cards are going to be reshuffled and the divergent interests of the different players in the field are not about to converge anymore in an overall unifying paradigm anytime soon. What we'll witness is fierce competition for credits that are diminishing in our indebted states. Something new will remain lost in cognition. We will continue to assume responsibility for the ongoing commentary of this loss. And in this commentary, we shall not lose sight but to of the extent to which the cognitive paradigma is in own way try to silence the body, reduced to his cognitive dimension. Even if this process is qualified as emotional, Lacan propose for psychoanalysis another way, an adjournamento of the Freudian unconscious that he called beyond the unconscious, the speaking body or the pal être. But this is uh, for the uh, psychoanalysis to follow up on this path and elaborate uh, on this practice of psychoanalysis in our time. Thank you.